Welcome everybody to our first video recap of our evolutionary biology class. This is supposed to be a brief summary of major concepts and I want to point out this is not a substitute for attending class. I expect you to be in class each and every time we have class. We start out by talking about natural selection which we define as differential reproductive success among individuals and population due to differences in their abilities to survive and reproduce. So some organisms have more offspring, some have fewer. Why? Some organisms are able just to have more offspring per litter, for example. Other organisms live more, more years, more periods of time, and that allows them to have more offspring. What's the relevance of this to evolution? We hypothesize that over time, many generations of natural selection can change the genetic makeup of populations so much that new species form. So this is our mechanism by which new species form. How do we define evolution? We define it as change in the allele frequency of a population over time. What's an allele? A variant of a gene. And we'll be visiting this again uh, in the not too distant future. So our first model of natural selection and evolution is going to be the HIV virus. We're not an HIV biology class, but we need a little bit of background on it to use this great model to discuss evolution in biology. In this diagram, which is uh, a little bit complex, but we see an HIV virion binding to the receptor and co-receptors of um, an immune cell. Let's see if I can get my little pointer here. We go right here, releasing the contents of its uh, virus head into its capsid, into the host cell. This is going to be an immune system cell. Uh, this is RNA that comes in. And a key step in this process is that the RNA that the virus has has to be transcribed into DNA, has to be reverse transcribed into DNA in order to be integrated into the host genome. And ultimately, this leads into making new viruses. Now, for our class, you don't have to have this diagram memorized by any means, but you do have to understand what's going on here enough so that you can explain and discuss the processes that are relevant to evolution. Now, a key enzyme in the process I just mentioned a moment ago is reverse transcriptase. This enzyme uh, reads RNA and by base pairing builds a corresponding uh, complementary strand of DNA. We're also looking here in this diagram of the drug AZT here, which is a nucleotide analog, and this inhibits chain elongation because there's no OH group here at the three prime position for new nucleotides to attach to. So this drug inhibits the activity of it, well, inhibits viral replication by blocking chain elongation. So reverse transcriptase is going to be a key player in our story here in evolutionary biology. This story is key for our class. This is an explanation of how natural selection causes a population of HIV viruses to go from susceptible to resistant. The key feature is that reverse transcriptase generates a variable population of viruses with different gene structures, and that makes some of them more resistant, some of them less resistant to HIV, and over time, those become the highly resistant variants in the population. Um, so definitely, you need to know this story well. This slide illustrates a very cool story about how it is that HIV actually causes AIDS and ultimately death in infected hosts. I encourage you to read it and enjoy it. However, this um, will not be part of an exam that we'll have in our class. These four postulates are the basis of the concept of natural selection. When each of them is fulfilled, then natural selection is acting on a population. We can identify them in our HIV example, and we definitely can identify them in the Finch example we'll be looking at in a moment. In that case, Peter and Rosemary Grant and their colleagues tested specifically each of these postulates and 
collected specific data sets to determine whether they were indeed in effect. We'll see that in just a moment. Peter and Rosemary Grant collected a lot of data that addressed the um, four postulates that we care about. And the first thing that they needed to do in order to determine that natural selection was leading to changes in the population over time in these ground finches was to assess for variability. Was there variation in the population of ground finches? So they examined what we call beak depth here. And over here we see a large beak depth on these birds. This is a very thick beak. Over here on the left, we see a very uh, small or narrow beak depth on these um, finches over here. And we see in our population, if we look on the x-axis, um, that the range goes from 6 to 14. The majority of the birds have beak depths between 7 and 12. And an average here indicated by this blue triangle around 9.4, 9.5. The kind of diagram we're looking at is a histogram. Each of these columns tells us how many birds have um, a beak depth uh, of a particular, how many birds have a beak depth as indicated on the x-axis. All right, so this answers the question, was the population variable? And the answer is yes, there was variation in the population. The next big question is, is that variability heritable? And in this diagram, we talked about how on the x-axis, we see the parents' beak depths. On the y-axis, we see the offspring's beak depths. And we have a very nice linear correlation here. If you have a parent who's got a small beak depth, you are likely to have a small beak depth. If you have a parent who has a large beak depth, you go up, you go over, you are likely to have a large beak depth. That is good evidence for heritability. The third thing that you need to check for is to see if there's differential survival of um, these birds in response to a selected pressure. And in this case, what we see here is in the top graph, we see all the birds in their average beak depth before a drought. And in the bottom graph, we see the average beak depth of the bird population after the drought. And what we see here when we look at the blue triangles is that the beak depth has shifted from about 9.4 on average to about 10.2. So this tells us that those birds that had a greater beak depth survived better than those that didn't. Um, and this is related to the seed story that we talked about in class and that you can read about. This slide addresses postulate four. It's the idea that individuals with the most favorable variations survive longer and have the most offspring. If we look at this data, we see uh, information about the finches that hatched before and after the drought. And we see that after the drought, the beak depth is larger than before the drought. And the most reasonable explanation for this is that the birds that survived the best had the biggest beak depth. So this data addresses postulate four. The take home messages from these data that we've been looking at are that natural selection can lead to changes in populations, whether you're a virus or a finch or any other organism, as long as those four postulates that we're referring to are taking place. In these data, we're looking at 30 years of change in finch phenotypes as measured by Peter and Rosemary Grant in response to um, changes in their environment. What caused the change? Natural selection. 